Psalm 119, we look at the next stanza, headed with the Hebrew letter Cheth, in verse 57. The psalmist writes, Psalm 119, verse 57, You are my portion. Is he yours? Is God your portion? So our title this morning is, The Word of God is My Portion. Now it doesn't say the Word of God. The psalmist is pointing to Jehovah himself and saying, God, you are my portion. But this stanza is going to emphasize what we've been learning throughout Psalm 119. That God is our blessing. He is the comfort. He is our strength. He is our purification. He is our mercy. He is grace. He's all these things. And so what we've been learning from Psalm 119 is that the Word of God is where we find and discover God. If God is to be our portion, we will discover and find Him to be that through the Word of the Lord, the revelation of God. So we find God. We discover God. We know God as our portion through Scripture alone. The psalmist is using a word that had rich meaning among the Israelites. It's the word that Brother John read to us in Deuteronomy verse, uh, chapter 10 and the ninth verse. The word portion means a tract of land, a plot or an inheritance. And when God brought the children of Israel out of the desert into Canaan, He divided the land by lots by shares, by portions. And it was their inheritance to be passed down for generations among the families, except for the tribe of Levi. Aaron also, in Numbers 18, he got no portion in the land. And of course, he died in Deuteronomy chapter 10. But the Levites, the Levitical priesthood, they did not get an inheritance. They had no share in the land of Canaan. Rather, God spread them out in 48 cities located through the land of Canaan to minister to the people of God. What did God say? I am your portion. I am your inheritance, Levi. Now, how was Levi, Levi supposed to respond to that? A land that flows with milk and honey is even used as an idiom today to express what? The conditions of a territory are so good, so rich... Such plenty in food, and there's lots of money, or great opportunity to make money. That's exactly what that phrase meant in the Bible. A land that was so rich and fertile, a good land and a large land, God would say Himself in Exodus chapter 3. And when they brought that fruit back, when the spies came, they said, Surely it is a land that flows with milk and honey. And they had one cluster of grapes hanging on a staff between two men, and pomegranates and figs. It was symbolic agriculturally as a land that brought great prosperity. How was Levi supposed to take those words? <clears throat> you are my portion. You're my share. You're my inheritance. So what the psalmist is saying using that rich word is the first what he states, God is his portion. So we ask the question, what does that mean specifically? And what is the experience of God as your portion supposed to be like? But then perhaps even more importantly, what does the psalmist then do in response to that statement that we find in these eight verses or this stanza? In other words, if God is your portion, then what are you doing in relation to God as your portion? And so we'll look at four things. We'll pull four things out of these verses. You might see more, but we'll limit ourselves to four and ask those questions as we move through this stanza. So again, verse 57, you are my portion, O Lord. I have said that I will keep thy words. I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. Be merciful unto me according to thy word. You are my portion, therefore I entreated your favor. It's the first thing he did. He entreats the favor of God. The word entreat means to ask earnestly. It also means, surprisingly, to be weak 
That's one of the nuances. And then to ask out of that weakness for something, it means to induce one's favor, induce meaning to persuade, to ask. Now, we just saw the word used with regard to Jeroboam in 1 Kings 13, which is why I read that portion so you could have a sort of a, a window with that word and see how it was used there. Jeroboam, when he pointed to the man of God, he said, lay hold on the man that gave him a prophecy he didn't like about the coming of Josiah to be the next king. His hand dried up, stiff like a stone, and he couldn't move it. And so he said to the man of God, entreat the Lord's face that my hand may be restored again. And so the man of God besought the Lord. So the Lord was induced to be favorable in place of His judgment. That's one of the means. He judged Jeroboam, and when the man of God besought the Lord and entreated the Lord, the Lord was favorable. Another place we see is not so favorable for Saul, but yet Saul used this word when he offered the sacrifice he should not have, when he waited seven days for Samuel, for Samuel said, Wait the appointed time, and I will offer the sacrifice and tell you what to do. In the meantime, it was the seventh day, and Saul grew anxious, and the Philistines gathered around, surrounding them. The people were scattered out of fear and rebellion, the Bible says. He offered the sacrifice. Then Samuel shows up, just like he said he would, and said, What hast thou done? He said, the people were scattered, so I made supplication to the Lord. What did he do? He induced God's favor. He requested it, aiming at success. Now that's one of the other nuances that's used. The first one, aiming at favor in place of judgment. But Saul was aiming for the favor of God, so he entreated God's favor, aiming at success. What kind of success? To defeat the Philistines. Now, when we take those nuances and apply it here, the Lord is my portion, and so the upshot is we are entreating the Lord's favor. We're, we're seeking to persuade God in some way as it relates to the portion and as it relates to God and His favor. So what does the word favor mean? And this really unlocks to me the, the key to what the psalmist is saying. We ask for favors, kind of a similar expression here. When you ask someone for a favor, you're asking, you're trying to induce them for some benefit that may give you success in doing something. But the word favor here means in front of, before, under the eyes of, in the sight of, in the face of, or in the presence of. What? God. You are my portion Therefore, the psalmist entreats. He seeks to induce God's presence with what? His whole heart. What experience is he after in inducing God as his portion to be his portion with a whole heart and God's presence come to the psalmist in such a way that he experiences God as his portion or his inheritance? Go back to Levi. Levi, what's your response? That you don't get the land that flows with milk and honey. You get God. See, when God is your portion, He is a superior treasure to all other portions. Now, you can see this in two places. First, Psalm 16. David, there speaking about the Lord. This is a messianic psalm. He would say this. The Lord is my portion and mine inheritance, thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. So David's using the same language, portion, inheritance. Who is his portion? Who is his inheritance? Who is that which is of his cup, he would say, and maintains his lot? It's God. He's speaking to God in Psalm 16. Preserve me, O Lord, he says in verse 1. You are my portion, you're my inheritance. The lines, which would be the boundary lines that an inheritance would point to in the land of Israel. There's the word again. The boundary lines have fallen out unto me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. Now the word 
Pleasant is alone in that text. They added the word places in italics. They added that because in context, it's talking about the place of Palestine, Canaan, the land that flows with milk and honey. But when we connect it, as David does, to God himself, the boundary lines of God have fallen out to him in places of pleasure because the word is repeated in the last verse. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy at thy right hand. It's pretty close, isn't it? There are pleasures forevermore. Inducing the favor of God, the boundary lines that David sees are the boundless lines of God's love and seeing God as the superior treasure than all earthly treasures and inheritances which have great value. You know, when you say the word inheritance, it invokes visions of great value even if it turns out that your earthly inheritance is not of such great value, the Word speaks to us as something of a treasure. So David says, the boundary lines that have fallen to me by the grace and mercy of God are the boundless lines of God's love in Christ and to be near to God. For God to be your portion is for God to be your superior treasure. Now what is David doing then, or the psalmist here? He's entreating God. And his presence, so he would experience God as his portion or as that which is superior to all earthly treasures. We should be asking God to be exactly what God is for us, which is our portion, our inheritance. Now, if you had a rich, vast inheritance coming to you, you would think about it, you would talk about it. And you would start experiencing what that treasure is for you even now as you ponder the reality of the coming inheritance. Well, of course, the psalmist is speaking about something both future that we have, but that he has now in God. The second place is Psalm 73, where Asaph had a moment where he had almost clean departed from God. He was struggling with the prosperity of the wicked, with their inheritance, what their lot was in this world, and he was grieved over it. In fact, he said, I've cleansed my hands all day long in vain. This purification thing, this church thing that we do, this service thing, Asa said, I've been doing that. And those are the people prospering, and I get nothing out of it. Really, Asa. Well, when he went to the sanctuary of God, he understood the end of those who prosper in the world, and that's all they have is an earthly allot, uh, allotment or inheritance, in contrast to what Asaph had. And this is what he said, Whom do I have in heaven but thee? And there's nobody on earth I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. What was Asaph's experience now that he had returned to God as God being his portion? As God being his share, his inheritance? Well, he tells us, there's nobody I have in heaven but God. There's nobody on earth I desire beside God. Beside God, which would express to rival God. A rival is someone that's competing for the superiority in some kind of activity. Asaph says, there's nobody in heaven that I have. Surely there was somebody in heaven that he loved and that he would see when he arrived. Some of you have people in heaven that you love dearly on earth. What does Asaph mean? He says, I have no one. In heaven but you. He means there's no one that rivals your superiority as the greatest treasure in heaven. Is that true for you? I don't care who's there. A departed husband, mother, father, wife, child. God is superior to all other treasures. And Asaph. In this expression says, there's no rivals to you in heaven and I don't want anything to rival you on earth. 
He's not saying there's nothing valuable in heaven. The people of God are there. They have value to us. He's not saying there's nothing of value on earth. He's saying there's nothing to rival God's supremacy and the superiority of His being treasure. You are my portion. You are the superior treasure. You're greater than the land that flows with milk and honey. You're greater than all the treasures of Egypt and Canaan. And therefore, Lord, I'm entreating you and your presence so I experience you as treasure. Do you experience God 24-7 as your treasure? I'll answer that for all of us. No, you don't. We don't, do we? We need to entreat God. We need to seek to persuade God that He would be this treasure and that we would seek Him as a treasure. David said in Psalm 27, When you said to me, Lord, seek your face, seek your favor, I said in my heart, I'm going to seek you. So what did he do? Verse 4, One thing of a desire of the Lord, and that will I seek after. One thing he desired as the superior treasure, and that's what he will seek after. What is it? To dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Is that your commitment? To behold the beauty of the Lord in the house is the implication. And to inquire about that beauty in the temple. Lord, when you said, seek my face, my heart said, I'm going to seek you. So what did David do? He sought the beauty of the Lord. What expectation do you think David had in seeking the beauty of the Lord? Disappointment? Let down? A waste of time? Or to see God as His portion, as the treasure He desired? Now the point, beloved, is that when God is your portion, you need to seek Him as your portion. There's something to be done in seeking after God who's made Himself your God. He's made Himself your portion and therefore we're to entreat God. We're to seek God. We're to go after God. We are to induce God and seek to persuade Him by grace to be that for us. Because that's what David, uh, the psalmist says, I entreated thy favor with my whole heart, a wholehearted pursuit of God, be merciful unto me according to thy word. So the point is, if he's saying, and the word here, mercy, is, is different than we've seen thus far. It means translated grace in Exodus 33. So he's seeking the grace of God, but how does he seek the grace of God as God being his portion, as he entreats God? Through the word. Okay. Be gracious according to the word. Be merciful according to the word, which means... The psalmist then seeks God as his portion by means of the Word of God. So if God is your portion, and if you trust in Jesus Christ, He is gloriously, then you will entreat God's favor, His presence, His face. And in so entreating that favor, then you will bring your face to the face of God, which is the Word of God, the character of God the person of God, and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is God your portion? Are you entreating God with your whole heart? And are you seeking to persuade God by means of the Word? Now that other nuance we talked about, weakness, is I think very important here because what is it that persuades God to be your portion? It is your weakness, right? In the context we've often mentioned in Matthew 9, where Jesus mentions that illustration or that figure of a doctor to a physician, that the people that are whole don't need a physician, but they that are, are uh, uh, weak, right? The whole, the righteous don't need Christ. But the patient comes to the doctor out of his need. In that context, what does he say? Go and learn what this means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Nothing persuades God more when you entreat Him 
than when you bring your need and your weakness and even your sickness, which is the nuance of this word. When you entreat God out of your deep need for Him, then His grace and His mercy are exalted and He satisfies our need in Him by being what? The treasure that we desire. God will be entreated. God will hear your cries out of the depths of your need in Jesus Christ. So beloved, we should seek God, we should entreat God, we should ask God, we should implore God, and we should induce to persuade God out of our weakness we're made strong. Out of our weakness, God's mercy is exalted and it's magnified. Now the upshot of this is in the first verse. When we're entreating God's favor with our whole heart, he says what? I have said, I will keep your words. When you're seeking God as your portion, you'll keep His words. When God is not your portion, you will not keep His words. When another treasure replaces God, then that treasure draws you after it. And the upshot is, we stop keeping the words of God. What have you said to God that you would do? Well, let me remind you and then we'll see if that fits. You and I both said upon our public profession of faith, we will walk together in brotherly love, watching over one another with an affectionate care, regularly praying for and encouraging one another, and will faithfully admonish and entreat one another as occasion may require. We agree by divine aid to conduct ourselves in a manner that is worthy of our calling, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, and remembering that being voluntarily baptized, we should live godly and righteously in this present world. We will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We will work and pray for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We will joyfully and regularly give as we are prospered for the necessity of those who preach the word to us, expenses of the church, relief of the poor, and spread of the gospel. To the nations. That's what you said. And so much more we did, didn't we? Every time the Bible says, do this one to another, as a Christian, you've said to God, I'll keep your words. But you can't keep them if God is not your treasure. Because whatever you treasure, if it's just the comforts of your own home, if it's just sitting in your easy chair, Whatever the treasures are, those treasures are going to lead your whole heart from the favor and presence of God. And as a result, you and I will no longer keep the commandments of God. God must be our treasure and we must seek Him as such or other treasures take hold of our hearts and then our bodies, our minds, our affections follow our treasures. Because Jesus said what? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now just think about this in the context of 1 Peter 2. I'm going to give you two or three verses there. Because Peter's going to take this idea of the Levitical priesthood, which we're talking about. The portion was God. They were not given the land. And he's going to apply that to every believer. You are the spiritual Levitical priesthood in the church today. So Peter would say, as you know, in verse 9 of chapter 2, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. In a way, you have taken the place of the Levitical priesthood, every believer. They were scattered in 48 cities to minister to the people of God. The priesthood today is scattered across the planet, gathered in the local churches to do what? To show forth the praises of Him who's called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. God has effectually called you, how? By the Spirit and the Word. And you saw the glory of Christ. And you saw Him as your portion. Supreme treasure. The second time Peter uses that word is a few verses earlier when he would say, you all as lively stones, you're being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. You're a holy priesthood. Your royal priesthood. The aim is to put on display through some means that Peter says 
a spiritual house that's being built, called a church, you're putting on display the glories of God who called you out of the darkness of night and death into the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. That you would offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now what is it going to take to do that? The Word. The psalmist says, according to your Word. I have said I will keep your Word. When is He going to keep the Word? When God is His portion. When are you going to be a building stone in the church of Jesus Christ as a holy priesthood and a royal priesthood? When you desire the sincere milk of the Word that you grow thereby. To whom coming. If you've tasted that the Lord is what? Gracious. You're coming. You're coming to Christ as what? Precious, Peter says. Let me put all that together for you. When by the Word, like newborn babes, we're desiring the sincere milk of the Word because we've tasted God as our portion, or Jesus is what? A precious treasure superior to all, superior to everything, you keep coming to the living stone and you become what? Lively stones. And what do you do? You're built up a spiritual sacrifice. All because Jesus is a precious treasure. Because if He's not, what's my heart going to do? Something is going to captivate my heart as a treasure. You cannot be neutral in this. You're going to seek some kind of treasure. Now one man's junk may be another man's treasure, but you're going to seek it. And wherever your heart plants and lands on a treasure, that's going to determine the pathway that you follow. If Jesus is your portion, then what you've said... By grace, by the Holy Spirit, you will then be on the pathway doing. If something eclipses the glory of Christ as your treasure, family, friends, money, power, or just comfort, it's going to affect how we keep God's Word. It's going to remove us from being a building block, a building stone, to doing what? Moving away from the commandments of God. So the first thing we learn, the Lord is my portion. So what, psalmist? I have said I will keep thy words because when he's my portion and I'm entreating him as that, then the commandment keeping obedience follows. Not perfectly, not sinless, but it follows. According to his word. Number two. The next thing he does with God is his portion I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. I made haste and delayed not. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. The next thing he did is he thought about his ways as it relates to the precepts of God. He thought, he turned. And he didn't delay. This is an Old Testament version of sanctification. Purification. He thought, because God is his portion. He turned, and he didn't procrastinate. And that last word kind of punches me in the gut. I don't know about you. Uh, spiritual procrastination. Now, there, there's some area in all of our lives that we do not procrastinate about, you know. Like you men at work, if you, if you do, you're going to get fired. You don't procrastinate there, probably. But when it comes to the commands of God, how often do we procrastinate? Do you know why that happens? Because there's so many other treasures that I need to tend to. Now, some of those treasures are just necessary, you know. You don't take care of your house, that is kind of a treasure, isn't it? You live there and you enjoy the life there, it's, it's going to fall apart. So, When all these portions and treasures take priority, you don't do much thinking about your ways. You don't turn your feet. And there's procrastination. Spiritual procrastination. Let's think about that. It's the Word 
that he uses to think about his ways. The word ways means just a direction, a pathway of life. He uses plural, just all of his ways. Uh, but it also has moral implications, you know, right and wrong issues. So it's not just about his feet and his hands. There's something about the heart he's thinking about because the Lord's his portion. He's beseeching or, or entreating God's favor with his whole heart. And then with his whole heart then, he's thinking, turning, and acting with haste. So let's think about that for a moment. If the Scripture is going to be that revelation of God that we seek with our whole heart, then the Scripture is going to expose us. It's going to expose something about our hearts. And what is it that it exposes? What your treasure is. See, we can't ignore that. This is so good for us, but it's so hard, isn't it? The Word of God is quick, it's living, it's powerful, it's active and energetic, and it, it's piercing even to the uh, dividing of the soul and spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of your hearts. And it exposes at the deepest level of your heart what's going on, what your treasures are. So it's incumbent upon us that the Lord is our portion, and we're entreating His favor with our whole heart, and we're wanting God to be that superior treasure, we've got to ask God through His Word to expose those treasures of the heart, because we all have some, don't we? See, we can't ignore that. So that, that then means we have to approach God's way, uh, God's Word in a specific way. So, for example, take uh, uh, an instruction manual. In, in my home, in my cabinet, I've got about 30 instruction manuals. We keep them over the years. Appliances, equipment, all kinds of things. Over the years, some of them are very old. There are two times I look at the instruction manual when I buy the appliance. I don't think they do a good job writing those things to begin with. It's just kind of confused. So I get at that. Open up, quick guide, quick start. One, two, three, four, start it, you're on your way. But there's another time I go back to that instruction manual when things aren't working as they should. I go to the troubleshooting page in the manual and it'll say, if this, if this, if this, if this, then do this, this, this. So I get the manual out and I go to the problem and I try to fix the problem. Now that's an approach to the Bible. That's an approach we should use, but that's not the only approach. If we only approach it that way, we don't go deep enough. For example, how many times has your lawnmower not started at this season we're in? And it can be rather frustrating. So you get out the instruction manual or YouTube, however you do it, and here's the troubleshooting guide. So you go to the, the uh, fuel pump or the carburetor. And the carburetor has all this trash in it. And the fuel pump is not pumping as it should. So you put a new fuel pump on and you get all the trash out of the carburetor and it works, problem fixed, for a while. Here's the problem we so often get in. Things got better. Problem solved. Then it won't start again. You know why? There's a fuel supply problem. Nine out of ten times there's a fuel supply problem. So I trace the carburetor, the tube, through the fuel pump back to the gas tank and there's bad gas in the tank. So many times we're using God's Word only as a troubleshooting guide, which it is. It'll troubleshoot your mouth and tell you when your words aren't right. It'll troubleshoot your feet and tell you when your feet in the wrong path. It'll troubleshoot your hands and your body, and it's a troubleshooter. But if you stop there, you got your hands in the right place, you got your feet back on the path for a while. And then the trouble comes again. Why? Because we didn't look to the level of the whole heart where the psalmist is looking to see where the treasures of his soul are lurking so that he can see at that level what's going on in the heart so that when he gets the trash out of the carburetor, it keeps, it keeps running, it keeps going. Because he's made a change that's fundamentally at the level of his heart and at a, at a source that's then going to help all the other issues going on in life. Now what that requires then, beloved, you've got to take time to be holy, right? 
You've got to take time to think on your ways and then to think, why are my ways that way? My parents used to say to me when I was young, Michael Allen, you're going to have to change your ways. Right? There's something deeper that needs to change, isn't it? For my ways to be changed. And so we've got to think on our ways and then think beyond our ways and think what's going on inside. We need to help our children think at an early age about what's going on inside. We just bring the troubleshooting manual of God's Word. You're not supposed to do that. This is what you're supposed to do. Say this. Don't say that. Now go on. Go outside and play. We miss the whole point. Why did you say that? What do you think you were after? What did you want? Now we're thinking at the fuel supply level. See, they stopped saying that for a while, and they stopped doing that for a while, and then it happened all over again, and again, and again. Yes, we're not to say that. And yes, we're to do this. We've got to go to the level of what? The love of God before the love of neighbor is worked out. The love of God in the heart. The, the boundary lines of David's inheritance in the love of God that he was treasuring that then is going to help him love his neighbor as he should. Are you taking time to be holy? Then you're going to take time to probe your own heart when the troubles arise. Or to probe your own heart when you're not having trouble. Right? David said, again in Psalm 16, he said, The Lord has given me counsel, and my reins instructed me in the night. Reigns is his conscience. So his conscience is first informed by the Word of God, but then in the night, his conscience tells him during the day if what he was doing honored God as he reflected on his ways. Do you ever reflect on your ways? Move away from the trouble. Move away from the problem. Say, why did I say that? What was I after, Lord? Teach me, Lord. Help me to see at the deepest level of who I am. Because the Word of God exposes and penetrates even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. It just means to the deep recesses of the soul. It'll tell you what you were intending to do. It'll tell you why you did what you did. If we let the Word of God examine us and show us what is deep within. It can be a very painful process, but what is the psalmist after? You're my portion. I entreat you with my whole heart. I've said I'll keep your words. Therefore, I thought on my ways. And then what? I turned my feet unto your testimonies. And then I made haste and delayed not to keep your commandments. So you move from thinking to turning to doing. Confession Conviction, confession, confession, change. See? Change without a conviction and a confession will not be lasting change. Conviction, there's, there's a, a guilty conviction. I admit it. I confess it, receive forgiveness. And now my feet turning back to the ways of God, I act upon that and make the change God is after. All by grace, all by mercy, but yet the psalmist is active. He is moving. Do you think on your ways, are you seeking to turn again and again your feet to God's testimonies, and do you make haste and delay not to keep His commandments? Number three, the bands of the wicked have robbed me, but I have not forgotten thy law. At midnight I will Rise to give thanks unto thee because of thy righteous judgments. The bands of the wicked have robbed me. So he, he doesn't forget God's law even in trouble. Now there's two possible ways this could be translated. KJV, I just read to you, other versions may say, the, the cords of the wicked ensnare or surround me. Either way, it's a way of trouble. The wicked are acting in a particular way toward the psalmist to ensnare him in some way or, as this version reads, to rob him. 
Bands can also be companies. The companies of the wicked rob me, but I have not forgotten thy law. Why? The Lord is my portion. I'm entreating His favor. I'm thinking of my ways. And so when the companies of the wicked rob me of my inheritance, they didn't rob me of mine inheritance. You see the point? To forget is to mislay, misplace. We often mislay things and misplace things. But the reason the psalmist didn't mislay the law of God is because of the value of God's law Because it's a revelation of God as His portion or His superior treasure. And so even at times when it's difficult, there's a struggle. There's things against Him. He's ensnared or He's robbed. What's His response? Because He's seeking God, His portion. The losses that are painful, the losses that have value, are not nearly to be compared to the greatness of the gain of God through what? Through His Word. So it's the law that's the revelation of God and it's through the Word of God that He's empowered to keep going in the pathway of obedience because it's not just a troubleshooting guide. He sees something about His heart. He sees something about God and it keeps leading Him on the pathway of God's Word. You remember this in Hebrews chapter 10 when some of the Christian Hebrews were being robbed, so to speak, and because of the robbery in reproaches and affliction, They were starting to linger and depart from the ways of God. So the writer there said, You took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Spoiling means something was robbed, something was taken, or something was destroyed about their property. Could have been somebody just destroyed it, or they robbed them of their property. Why? Because of being a Christian. You took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, and how did you do that? You had a portion. Knowing that in heaven you have an enduring and an abiding substance, goods, inheritance. The Lord is your portion. So they took joyfully the plundering of earthly goods because of what they had in heaven, or their hope, in Christ alone. It'll do the same for us, beloved. And they they came into that inheritance, seeing it, knowing it, after they were illuminated, the writer says. What illuminated them? The Spirit and the Word. They saw Jesus as their portion through the Word. And as they hung on to Jesus, through the law, through the Word, what happened? Their goods were plundered, spoiled, robbed, but they did not forget God's Word. Why are they forgetting it in Hebrews chapter 10? Because Jerusalem, Moses, the Mosaic age and the law had become superior treasure than Jesus. And the writer is calling them back to the pathway, calling them back to God as the superior treasure. And so even in trouble, beloved, we can be sustained by God's grace through the Word As we do what? Verse 62. At midnight I will rise to give thanks unto thee because of thy righteous judgments. Robbers rob people at midnight or in the night. And so the psalmist wakes up at midnight. What does he do? He gives thanks. I don't take that to mean he's sitting in his bed thanking God as the robbers are moving through the house and taking all his goods. But this is a counter to forgetting God over Uh, possessions and things that are taken from us, robbed, versus what? Giving thanks when you're robbed. Is that biblical? Yes, it is. In everything, give thanks. For all things, give thanks. There's a qualification there. You're not, Lord, I thank you these guys are doing evil, or I thank you that we're experiencing this pain. No, there's something in it by which you can thank God. You can arise at midnight in your greatest troubles, in your greatest sorrows and pains, and there's something to be thankful for that you can find in that moment, even though all around you may be falling apart. So if that's not true, then 
You have a right to complain and murmur, which is the opposite of giving thanks. See, malcontent people, malcontent people are dissatisfied and they're complainers about everything that's happening. We live in a culture of malcontents. But as Christians who have God as their portion and God on their side, we are to be content and thanksgiving is an expression of contentment. Right? As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Having been rooted, be built up in the faith as you have been taught, overflowing with thanksgiving. It's like a tree rooted. You have been rooted. You've been united to Christ forever. And out of that union with Christ, be built up by the faith or the Word that you've been taught and that you're reading and that you're understanding. And then overflowing with thanksgiving will remove the vulnerabilities of being robbed. Next verse. Listen to the verse. Beware lest any man spoil you. Now here what they're robbing is not your goods, but you. Beware lest anyone takes you captive like booty or spoils in the world. They, they take you away. What's going to keep you from being taken captive? Thanksgiving of all things. I wouldn't have believed it, but there it is. Rooted being built up, abounding in the faith and in thanksgiving. Now the vulnerabilities are greatly lessened. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you have enough. You're complete in Him. The fullness of God. The fullness of God in Christ, and Christ is in you. Therefore, you, you always have a reason to give thanks in the worst of times. The hands of the wicked have robbed me, but I didn't forget your law. Why? At midnight I rise to give thanks to God who is my portion, my treasure, my all, my life, my love, my strength. Because of thy righteous judgments. Of course, we've seen righteous judgments, righteous decisions, because in all God's decisions concerning you, whether those decisions mean great trouble and sorrow and pain, or whether those decisions mean great prosperity, or somewhere in between. We can thank God in all seasons because of His righteous judgments, because His judgments are related to Him being our portion, and that's where He's taking us. Always, always. So that we would see Him more as our portion. Isn't God good? And then lastly, He would say in verse sixty. Three, I am a companion of all them that fear Thee, and of them that keep Thy precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of Thy mercy. Teach me Thy statutes. Next, God is His portion, therefore His friends are the ones that fear God. Oh, what a lesson for us here this morning. Who are your friends? Who are your companions? Notice what he didn't say. I am a companion of those who like what I like. Who like to do what I like to do. They like the hobbies I like, the activities I like. They're my age. I like people like that. Now, of course you like people your age. And of course you like people that do what you like to do. But he made a companion of those that fear God. Who is that? Those, parallel, those that... Keep the precepts of God. No matter what they like. Because they like God. And God is their portion. Are you a companion with people in the covenant community called church? Say, yeah, I would be, but nobody ever texts me or calls me. Look at the text. He's the one active. I am a companion. I'll do the calling. I'm going to do the texting. I'm going to reach out. I'm going to plan this event. I'm going to go do this. The psalmist is not waiting because God is his portion. He understands if he lives in isolation, he's vulnerable to having other treasures. If God 
in His infinite wisdom, thought, I'll put it that way, thought that you could live in isolation. He, why have a church? Why have this community? Why have these companions? Because you can't. I cannot live in isolation. As soon as I do, treasures of the world start encroaching and I start moving away from the commandments of God. Are you living in isolation? Even in family isolation. It's not your church. Right? That's good. That's what we're to be about. But there's a covenant community called the church for which families become part of. I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. Paul told Timothy, the young preacher, flee youthful lust and follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, Timothy's young, so he addresses youthful lust. There's old people lust, I guess you could call it. Yes, they're, they're different, but they're there. So, Timothy, as a young man, you need to be like a refugee running from, from youthful lust. Fugeo, refugee. There were cities of refuge in Israel, for which if someone accidentally murdered someone, they could run to for sanctuary. But if they didn't get there fast enough, if a family member caught them, they could execute them. How fast do you think the people would run? Timothy, flee like a refugee away, away from youthful lust. Run from it. But you've got to be running for something. Flee youthful lust. Run after is the word follow. Run after righteousness, faith, love, peace, or run after Christ. Run after Christ. Do it with those that are calling on the Lord out of a pure heart. How do you know if somebody has a pure heart? You can't, you can't see my heart. What am I running after? What are you running after? That's a pretty good indication. Now, you've you got to be careful. You could, you could look from afar and you look at Jesus and say, well, surely He's not running after God. Look, look who He's hanging around. So that, but when you, you're running after God and you find others running after God because they love God and therefore they're loving their neighbor, then you become companions with those that fear God and that love God. Because, Timothy, the false teachers that I'm telling you to charge that they teach no other doctrine, you may be vulnerable if you don't have good brothers and sisters to stand with you in the good fight of faith. You need this, Timothy. You're not an island, Timothy. Preacher Timothy. You cannot live in isolation apart from the covenant community. You need to be part of a covenant community called the church. And there, there's accountability, there's help. Because the people of God are all saying in unity, God is our portion, and therefore we're pursuing God and helping one another in that pursuit, by watching over, admonishing, entreating, praying, and serving one another. How are we doing, church? Just a good place for us to ask ourselves, how are you doing? How am I doing? Will you consider your ways? Will you look at your feet? Will you turn back again, if need be, if necessary, to being the kind of church God has called us to be? Or have the treasures of the world, just the treasures of business. That's not a treasure, is it not? Business equates to time. Time equates to either what you have to do or what you want to do. Well, there's a treasure there. I'm just too busy. Why are you too busy? Did God make you too busy? And then the last verse. The earth, O Lord, is full of thy mercy. Teach me thy statutes. The word mercy here is loving kindness. Why does he connect the fullness of God's goodness, loving kindness to all of creation with teaching statutes? And I'll turn to Psalm 145 and I'll end there as I read this portion. Psalm 145, he mentions the goodness, the mercy of God. Verse 9, the Lord is good to all and His tender mercies over all His works. He's good to everyone. 
All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. Verse 11, Psalm 145. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power. Skip down to verse 15. It's talking about the goodness of God in context, the mercy of God to all of creation. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and you give them their meat in due season. You open your hand, and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Acts 14, God has not left Himself without witness of His goodness or His loving kindness, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Every single created thing has their hunger desire uh, satisfied by God and their thirst quenched by God. That is their physical body. And their bodies warmed by clothing. Everything they see, eat, and take in in their bodies is from God. He's good. The earth is full of His goodness. But then notice what he says in Psalm 145. Verse 19. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear Him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth all them that love Him, but all the wicked will He destroy. Now, we have a desire being fulfilled that's beyond all of creation, but to the people of God who what? Fear Him or love Him. So when he looks at the the fullness of God's goodness in creation. Say, God, how good you are to all of creation. You satisfy every desire. Now teach me thy statutes. What's he saying? Lord, satisfy my soul. You satisfy our bodies all the time. The food, the drink, the, what our eyes can see in creation, all the enjoyments. You give it to everybody. But, but for me, Lord, teach me your statutes. Because it's through the statutes of God that we see Him as our portion and that He satisfies our souls and that we love Him and fear Him by means of the Word. They shall all be taught of God. Everyone that heareth and learneth of the Father comes to Jesus as what? John 6. Bread. I am the bread of life. Is Jesus the bread of life for you? Have you seen Him as your portion? Have you seen Him as superior to all treasures, although we acknowledge I have not treated Him that way at all times? Do you see Him as precious? Precious cornerstone. Sure foundation. Although I haven't treated Him always, I confess, as precious. I do see Him that way. Then take up your cross. And follow Jesus. And see if He will not satisfy your soul. Entreat His favor. So that we may keep His commandments. Think on your ways and turn your feet. When you experience trouble, don't forget His word. Give thanks. And then finally, when you see the fullness of creation and you experience it today when you go home, you're going to experience the goodness of God. Transfer that to Jesus Christ and say, teach me, teach me, Lord, your ways and your statutes. And Lord, will you satisfy my soul? And the answer of God will be, in ways that you will never imagine, in part now, but forever and ever, you will experience joy at the right hand of God and pleasures forever and ever and ever. May God be magnified. Let's pray. Father, You are a great God, and as we look at Your Word, we would just have to confess, Lord, that we fall so short of what it says. It's so far above our heads as we all look up at it, and we long to be there uh, more closely uh, conformed to it. So, Lord, we, we just understand from the psalm, it's out of our weakness that we entreat You. We entreat Your mercy, so we ask, Lord... Show yourself as our portion again and again. So many ways we have treasured creation above you. That's our wired way of thinking by nature. We confess it. We own it. We acknowledge it. Lord, help us to leave here and to have more time to think on our ways. To think on what our hearts enjoy and love. And Lord, turn our feet again to you over and over. May we not procrastinate when it comes to obedience and make the changes that by grace through the Holy Spirit you enjoin us to make 
that you would have the glory. Lord, we complain often. We're just confessing our weaknesses based on the psalm. We complain, we murmur, we, we don't uh, often rise to give thanks even in the morning. May that be the first words out of our mouths to thank you that you've made yourself our treasure and us your people. And to remember we are the priesthood of the New Testament. We, we are to do the service of God and offer spiritual sacrifices. So show us Jesus is precious more and more that we may be able to uh, be drawn to this building project where your glory is appearing and we are answering the prayers of the destitute and the bankrupt. What a delight, Lord, to think of you that way. And Lord, may the fullness of creation that we will experience today and every day, just praying this psalm, Lord, may we, we see that you are our fullness in Christ. And so teach us your ways, your statutes, your word, so that we would see you that way and just find joy and obedience. Just, just obedience for its own reward. Because you are our great and exceeding shield, reward, and treasure, just as you told Abraham. Make it so, we pray by grace, in Jesus' name. Amen.